Hey there, I'm Joe Weems. Before we get into the video, I want to remind you about NGConf 2023 happening in Salt Lake City, Utah on June 14th and 15th. Head over to ngconf.org to check out the speakers, check out the talks, and to get your ticket before they all sell out. We'll see you there. Uh, thanks for being here. I'm going to be talking about simplifying deep Angular forms with DI-equipped custom components. Uh, try, try saying that five times fast. I'm out of breath already. Uh, so my name is Rafael Mestre. I'm from Puerto Rico, which is this tiny little island located in the Caribbean, if you don't know about it. Pretty good vacation spot. Um, I'm a senior software engineer working with the best people in the world at Hero Devs. Um, so let's talk about something first. Uh, breaking into tech is hard, and I've been there before. I, uh, before I became a software engineer, I was a computer technician for over 10 years. Uh, and that, at that time, I had already completed my computer science degree. Uh, but even then, there's uh, real life happening around you. The world is not going to stop for you. Uh, so I couldn't quit my job. Uh, it was really hard. I had kids. Um, but uh, everyone's story is different. So don't be discouraged, because that's what I had to go through, and this is where I am today. So uh, do what you got to do, uh, degree or no degree, experience or no experience. Um, you got this, and we're here for you. <laughs> so I actually got pushed out of my comfort zone. So those 10 years of being a computer technician didn't just vanish. I was laid off from my job. Uh, and so that's what uh, pushed me into actually doing something about it and landing my first job as a software developer. I had to uh, get creative with my resume, but it got my foot in the door. And then, you know, once I got that opportunity, then once you're inside, you can prove yourself. Um, it helped me out a lot to just uh, dive into. Uh, documentation, ask questions, read source code, pick people's brains. Um, sometimes uh, it, it could come off as sort of second guessing somebody's decision. It doesn't matter. Sometimes just taking a second look at something is going to uh, unlock new possibilities for you uh, and you just uh, learn from yourself. So let's actually talk about forms right now. Uh, the web is literally built on forms. It's how end users talk to our applications. Even if it's the smallest form, like a single email field for a newsletter subscription, or a checkbox on a terms and conditions, or one of those job applications where after you've uploaded your resume, you have to enter everything again, <laughs> that's a pretty complex form. Um, in Angular, is built on top of that platform, and it provides many, many tools to make form authoring uh, easier and more robust. It's the best experience out there right now with frameworks. And another very powerful tool that Angular provides is dependency injection. Um, recently, people have been asking me around the halls, like, what, what's your talk about? And I just tell them, well, it's about forms and DI. And most responses are sort of, well, what do forms have to do with dependency injection? And that's what we're going to find out today. So this topic came to me when I was working on an enterprise app, a big, bad enterprise app, with lots and lots of forms. Uh, but there was this main feature that was a really complicated form made up of many, many subforms, uh, a lot of custom validation going on, uh, nested fields of the same types being reused. 
and the requirements changed a lot of times. It was well architected, but it was still uh, built in a certain way where uh, every time a uh, change needed to be made, it was uh, hard because those changes would cause a cascade of other uh, problems. And we ran into some issues when using the typical patterns of passing down form slices as inputs. Uh, so naturally, I dived right in and tried to find an alternative solution to this problem. Um, and what you'll find is that most of these techniques, most of these tools are already built into the framework. It's just that we're not used to accessing them that way. So, um, sorry about the bright background. I saw a couple reactions, I'm, I apologize. Um, also, my uh, demo app that I built is not very pretty, but uh, bear with me here. This is sort of a family tree contact info thing. Um, but the point is to illustrate the concept that I learned. It's a form that's pretty basic initially, but it can get pretty deep. When you start adding controls, you can have, a, a, in this hypothetical case, a person can have any number of phones, emails, uh, an address can have phones and emails nested to themselves, and then a person can have other persons associated via relationships that is the same structure uh, repeated over and over. And uh, to break that down, uh, just briefly, the innermost components are gonna be like the most basic form group components. So like a form entity, an email entity, an address, and the person, which is the same component that we're gonna be using in the outer layer. And the green boxes, I don't know if the green is visible, but uh, choice of color is terrible. But those are gonna be sort of an ent entity wrapper that are also going to take away some of the logic from that main component and handle that separately. The idea is that we want to be able to decouple the logic as much as possible. Components are cheap, so if you need to build 100 components in a certain way, then just peel that logic apart. Um, so yeah, pretty simple implementation, right? You have uh, input, that's a form group type. You bind that to the component and that's it. That's the pattern we typically use. And this is the entity pattern. We're gonna focus sort of on just one or two components since all the uh, concepts are gonna be well encapsulated there. So the rest uh, of the application doesn't really matter. In this case, we're taking in a uh, form array as an input. And in here, we're iterating over the controls of that control. Sorry, we're iterating over the controls to bind the controls and pass them down to the component that we saw previously. I'm not gonna talk about inputs a lot, but uh, something that stood out to me and I think it's important to mention is that if you haven't looked at strictly type forms, this is uh, one of the best use cases that I find. If you, look at, uh, if you look at the differences between these two slides, you'll see that there's an er a type error that goes away just by providing a form group type as a generic to the form array. So th that was one of the issues I ran into a lot before, that when form uh, uh, abstract control types aren't narrowed, you'll run into this sort of issue, but by providing the generics now, that experience is a little bit simplified. Um, so we were going to talk about dependency injection, right? Inputs were great for the most part, and you're still gonna be using them in most cases. Um, but this other pattern that we're going to learn now is very useful, and in cases where you simply can't access inputs or components don't have direct communication, dependency injection is what you're gonna reach for. If you haven't heard about it, control container is a base class for directives that contain multiple instances of a control. So what does that mean? That means that these familiar directives that we normally use in the template are available to be injected. We use form group directive all the time without thinking of what's going on under the hood. It's not just an input binding, it's a pretty powerful tool. So 
How do we use it? Here's the phone component we saw before, but this time, instead of an input, we're injecting the control container as a parameter in the constructor, and the template looks basically the same. In the host component, you can use it the same way you were doing it before with a form group binding, or you could use form group name. In this case, it's binding to the index of the form array, and it's gonna, be, it's gonna do that dynamically. You could also do this with ng model group, so I haven't forgotten about template driven forms. Other cool things that you gain from using the control container is access to the control name, which is pretty useful in my experience, and access to the parent form, which is definitely useful. So one problem with this approach is that control container has the broader type of abstract control, which is more or less the same problem we talked about before, where you pass a generic to the form array, and you need to narrow the types down. Here, we're just using a getter to coerce the type as form group, but it's not ideal. So if we look back to the subclasses that we talk about, um, they have the same underlying structure as the control container. So that means that we could use them directly as well. We can inject those. And you gain all the benefits we talked about before with control container, but their type's a little bit better. Their types are narrower. So if you inject form group name directly, you get a form group control. And Form array name gives you a form array, and so on. We use them in the template all the time, but this is actually what's going on under the hood. So you gain type safety, but at the expense of flexibility. You can't do this anymore because you're injecting form group name directly. You're not injecting the superclass of control container anymore. So you may need to handle other, <clears throat> excuse me, other variations as well, which is also not ideal. And, but we can go one step further than that. We can use an injection token to create sort of a more complicated composed type where here we're trying to inject form group name, form group directive, and ng model control at the same time. And by annotating them with the optional flag, then you can control the flow of errors, so you can provide a more significant error to your consumers. And you can decide which, which of these directives is gonna get precedence by using other injection flags like skip self or host. So we can use this using the shiny new inject method. That's not really new, but uh, now we're more open to using it. And you get all the benefits that we talked about earlier without the downsides. You have uh, more strictly typed form control, uh, form group, sorry. And you can support all the types of directives. And you can compose these in any way that's useful to you. You can change the flags around, support sometimes some types of forms and not support the others. But please support template-driven forms. <laughs> um, another step further is that we can inject the form itself. So this example is pretty trivial. Um, it's a reset button that calls a pretty simple component. But it's an idea of ways that you can create composable, reusable components that you can drop around in any of your forms, and it'll work without having to think about input bindings, of what your form is actually called. And here's another example of sort of the same scenario. 
There's other things that you could do with this pattern as well. If you're injecting the form, you could choose to listen to value changes, for example, create a component that you drop into your forms and then just sync with local storage or call a backend or something like that. The idea is to create reusable elements that you can uh, take around in all of your forms, not have to think about the input bindings, and remove complexity from your main component. Um, you can also do this with ng control. You can more specifically inject form control name or ng model, but that's a little more nuanced since you have to implement control value accessor anyway. Um, so in the future, to build upon this strategy, I'd like to see strictly type injectables. Like if it would be ideal if we could, for example, pass a generic to the control container, form group name directives, or any of those, considering that we can't infer from the context what the type of that nested form group is going to be. Form array directive would also be a pretty useful addition since I run into this use case all the time. It's a pretty uh, upvoted in the Angular repo, so I hope that this is something that we get to see. And host directives, which are, is promising to be one of the most powerful Angular features in recent memory. It's going to be really, really good for uh, library authors. Um, for this talk, I used Control Container and I. That's a really, really great talk that showcases the usage of Control Container as, an, as a dependency to create multi-step forms using a router. Angular Forms by Kara Erickson. It's from 2017, but it's still a very good resource. So if you're interested in this topic, check it out. And this guide for template-driven forms by Tim DeShriver. Hopefully I got that right. A very, very good resource for everything related to template-driven forms and how it's a huge misconception that you can't do things with template-driven forms, that reactive forms can. The links to all the resources are in this single link. So if you scan the QR code, you can see the slides. You can see the links to the, these videos. And that's it. Um, a couple takeaways for me is that dependency injection is a big, big thing in Angular. So play around with other types of directives or components where you may be able to inherit. And you might be able to unlock even more use cases, not strictly related to forms, just in general. Angular is getting better every single day. If you were here yesterday, you saw the keynote, you saw the great talks by the Angular team. Angular isn't going anywhere. The DX is going to get better and better. So don't be discouraged by other camps. I'm sticking with Angular for the long term. Finally, share your knowledge. I hesitated a billion times when I was pitching this talk. And it doesn't matter if 100 people have talked about this before. Your point of view is always important, and there's always new things that someone else might have overlooked, or just your perspective is, should be out there. So thanks for listening. Hope you guys enjoyed. Hope the content was good. I'll be around if you have any questions. So that's it.